You're listening to Exit Strategy Podcast, a podcast about geopolitics, conflict, and the illicit political economy with me, your host, Jody Ray. In this podcast, I interview conflict reporters, journalists, political dissidents, academics, and other experts around developing topics in international affairs. But this is only half of the project. This is only half of Exit Strategy. If you like this project, check out Exit Strategy TV, a video exploration project that showcases my personal journeys through some of the least visited places on earth to uncover the culture, the conflict, and the cuisine. You can get full access to this at www.patreon.com slash exit strategy show for the price of a couple cups of coffee a month. This helps me keep exit strategy ad free and finances producing captivating and thought provoking audio and video content. Please consider supporting patreon.com slash exit strategy show or with a one time patronage through Venmo at exit strategy show. Thank you so much for your support. Eduardo Sotera Jalil has won the first prize at this year's UNICEF Photo of the Year Award with his image of two children and a partially destroyed primary school library in Ethiopia's war-torn Tigray region, taking solace in books. It's a striking photo and one that he seems to have captured while the children weren't even paying attention. It doesn't seem staged. The lighting is just transcendent. It's a fascinating fascinatingly beautiful image and certainly deserves this year's award uh, for UNICEF Photo of the Year. I speak to Eduardo, Mr. Jalil, uh, an Argentinian photographer, uh, about the philosophy of photography, the philosophy of photography, specifically in conflict zones, uh, in war-torn areas where he's traveled around the world, what it's like getting access to uh, these very difficult areas to uh, make photography. Um, and we talk about, you know, his previous work and what he's going to be up to next. I hope you enjoy this very fascinating conversation. Please consider supporting this work at www.patreon.com slash exit strategy show. Thank you. Eduardo Sotera Jalil, thank you so much for joining the podcast this morning. I appreciate your time. And thank you. Thank you for the invitation. So as we were uh, we were just speaking as right before I hit record, um, you were telling me, well, repeat what you said, actually. No, I was telling you that in many cases, uh, mainly about my late work, which has been basically, you know, covering the conflict in Tigray. As you can imagine, it has been very complicated even to, to talk about it, no? Um, situation for, for journalists during this conflict was really, really complicated. Yeah. Really complicated. Uh, and, and as you know, the, the coverage was very scarce, no? The, 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 there was not enough journalists uh, covering the development of the conflict. Um, so, well, that, that, that's more or less what I was saying. Yeah. Um, you said you were stepping on toes or some of your, some of your, your work was stepping on the toes of governments. Can you, um, let's first give you an introduction, right? You're a documentary photographer, photographer. How do you like to introduce yourself? How do, what do you, uh, what do you say at, at a cocktail party? I, I, I would, <laughs> uh, well, I'm a photographer, no, I, and, and, and I do documentary work. That's how I started in photography. Um, I've been very lucky in in the last years since I moved to Africa because I, I started doing a lot of photojournalism. Uh, I started working in DR, DRC in, in Congo for AFP. So I, I started covering news, basically. By documentary photographer, what I mean is that um, I understood quite late in my life that I, I wanted to take photos and I wanted to develop long-term projects, mainly about people, that this has been the, the main interest for me in, in photography. Uh, so I, I started developing, I was lucky also, I, I started developing long-term projects 
which is something as you can imagine is, is quite difficult to, to sustain economically. Uh, but somehow I understood that I had an agenda quite different from the news, quite different from the work I do usually for money that had some interest in some publications. Uh, and for me, it was fascinating. It's still, it is, no? Uh, but mainly, the, that's how I will define myself, documentary photographer. I, I also am a photojournalist for Agence France Press. I also work for different media and international organizations. That, that's what I do. That's that's fantastic. I I caught wind of you from the uh, obviously the the most recent photo that you took um, in Tigre, uh, where you won the award. I'm sure you've been giving talks about that or had said, have had some things to say about that. Um, can you tell me about that? Yeah. Well, uh, recently I I got a, a very important prize and and I was very happy. I, I got the UNICEF Picture of the Year. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. The, the, because of a photo I took uh, in Tigray. It, actually, you know, it's interesting. It, it's a photo I took quite at the beginning of the conflict. It was the the end of 2020 my second trip to the field and, and it's a photo that shows two children in a in a library of a rural school in in Bisover, a very small village in in ethiopia in the north and, and this library was looted and these children um, basically started started playing with books while I was there. No, they started reading at them and they started playing around. And the light was very beautiful. And there was a moment that somehow all the things got together and I was able to take a photo. And for, for me, this was important no? and it's an important part of, of my work. Um, I don't intervene in the scenes. No, It's part of my contract with, uh, with the audience. Uh, I never tell people what to do, except when I'm doing a portrait, and it's very clear that it's a portrait. Uh, I don't intervene, so you know, I arrived to the to this library. Uh, it, it was very. I knew that there was a photo there, but of course, empty. It didn't work. Then doubles came in, didn't work either. And then you know, I I tried to be a, a fly on the wall and just waited that these children came and well, it it happened. But it's interesting, you know, how, um, how this thing of photography works, at, at least for me, you know, in terms of, of interest, you know, uh, um, children, you know, for me, since I'm a father, this is an important part of, of my life and what it represents in the war. And also something that for me is very important is books, you know, uh, sure. I'm a big fan of, of books, uh, uh, as uh, as an object uh, and as what it represents, no? Um, I have a long fight with my wife about moving books from one country to another. Uh, so it, it, it was interesting how these things were present in a photo that I really liked you know, and that uh, I decided to present for this contest. Yeah, no, I mean, the the the, the photo itself is is absolutely striking. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and the way the light is shining through that part of the window, the cracks of the wall, it's fantastic the way, uh, how you were able to capture that. I guess I, you touched on this at the beginning. It's almost too good of a photo and tell me, and you could push back, tell me if I'm wrong. It's almost too good of a photo to be included in a news piece, right? Would it, it wouldn't work in the same way because it, do you agree that maybe some of the photography that's used in journalism, it. And because of the speed at which we have to publish news in developing situations, that photos sometimes lose a little soul, where whereas they don't when they are standalone or individualized the way like this photo was. This is an interesting point. I don't know. You know, yeah, yes and no. Why? Because I, I remember when I when I started in this profession. When I wanted to be a photographer, I, I was already a bit old. No, I was in my thirties. Uh, I remember talking with. I was trying to find a place in in news agencies, 
and, and you know, for me, it was quite a world. And I remember having a conversation with uh, Enrique Mardi, who was at that moment the, the, the chief of, of photography for AP in Jerusalem. And he told me, listen, man, remember here we make pizza. No, in the sense that, you know, I, I remember coming with my hand printed black and white mm-hmm. uh, uh, photos from my first documentary project. But, you know, with the ears, I understood that, yeah, we make pizza, man, but you can make a gourmet pizza, no? In this case, uh, I think, at least about myself, what you're saying about the soul and all this, is that uh, somehow, and, and this is something I, I learned uh working in AFP with, with my boss, uh, Marco Longari, you know, that, uh, yeah, man, sometimes we do, n- not only that, that we need to be faster, but also we do the same thing over and yeah. over again. You no, know, like, I remember my first coverage of elections in Congo, I was with him, and the second, third day, I tell him, listen, man, but this is, this is the same you know, every day. Yeah, yeah, but the moment you start seeing it's the same, you should quit, no? Because why? Maybe it's not about an election, but in this case, about the war. Man, I want people to know the shit that is going on. Sure. And for me, the way to do it, to send a message, is to hide it as good as possible in a beautiful image. No matter how tragic the thing can be, this aesthetic thing, it's a tool of deceivement, of, of, of cheating on people, so they will pay attention. In publicity, I don't know, they will put someone attractive, no? So yeah, I, I want to make an attractive photo in order to send a message. So sometimes I can, no, even though, you know, you need to find, you need to be fast. Uh, you, sometimes you need to do two things at the same time because, I don't know, in, in this world, there were parts where my colleague of video could not come and I had to do the two things, photo and video. But, you know, I, I take it as a personal and professional responsibility that I want people to take a look at what's going on. And and this is not, you know, this is not about changing the world. Sure, it's, sure. I don't think that we can change, that photography can change the world. What I think is that people can change the world. It's us that we can make a difference. So if, if I will have the chance that one of my photos will deliver a message to someone that can change things, I, I will be more than happy, and this will be more important than any prize, no? Um, I'm, I, I think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting old, so I'm, I'm losing a lot of my idealism. I, I think this is quite a pragmatic thing in terms of my contract, with myself and what I want to do of my life. Sure. Uh, but, uh, you were asking me also about my background. I, I studied economics and, and I used to be an accountant. Horrible. <laughs> Horrible. I was very bored. So the moment I decided to quit that, it's because I wanted first, never again in my life to work. That was the thing. I didn't want to work. Uh, and by that I mean to find something that for me doesn't feel like work. Yeah, it feels like in my life. Uh, so well, the, so, sorry, I'm taking it long, but that's okay. Really no, hard. I I want to 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 be that that my li- that my life will make sense also to me. Sure. Yeah, no, it's very important, and unfortunately, some sometimes. Uh, not everyone on this uh, on this earth gets to uh, gets to do that. So props to you for being able to find something that you're passionate about. It's very um, 
that's very that's that's very important. It's very important for for one's mental health. Um, part of the reason I started this podcast uh, was because of the Tigray War. It was a conflict that was getting absolutely no press as it was raging on during COVID. Um, I think in the wet in Western media. Um, it was not covered for a variety of reasons or undercovered for a variety of reasons, part part of which it's just Ethiopia is still very unknown to the rest of the world. It speaks a different language that's not a, a UN designated language. Um, you know, it's difficult to know uh, exactly what was happening there. You know, the country is the only country in Africa that remained uncolonized from European powers. It, there's not a lot of connections there. There's a whole host of reasons why um this was underreported and still i think is still um you know one of those conflicts that was probably the worst we've seen in modern history and it's still that hasn't that hasn't stuck in the minds of of many people so when i come across um a chance to talk about it um i've had several guests on the on the on the podcast um to to talk about it you said um uh, uh just recently that you wanted people to know the shit that was going on. It's a great way of putting it. Um, and another one of those reasons it was undercovered was journalists had such a difficult time getting into Tigray, getting uh, humanitarian access, any kind of access to that ground, to the grounds there, um, or being on the ground. It was very difficult, if not impossible. Um, so I'd love to hear your story. How did you get in at the beginning? What kind of hurdles did you have to jump through? set up the story like what was it like what, what what had to happen for for all of this to come together for you it, it's interesting no because first of all well, we are the team we were a team of three people and that's usually the, at least how we work in afp you know there is someone sure. in charge of text uh, who is running the office in in ethiopia someone in video and, and me in photo and my colleague in text in that moment, he was amazing. Robbie, Robbie Corby Bullet, all, all the, the dispatch from, from the north was made by him. And he managed to keep a, a quite an independent line on the conflict. And at the same, at the same time, had asked, he assured us access to all the places. But it's interesting because at the beginning of the conflict, uh, we 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 had no access at all. Like we were already in, in reaching the front line. The the day two days after the war started, it started on the fourth, the sixth. We were already heading north. We were the first one, and we had no access, and it was confusing. And letters and uh, and some other media somehow they were invited to go. But then things reverted. He he had a great deal in that, and 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 I'm very thankful for for the chance of of working with him, uh, because he managed to revert that, and we were able to to get access when nobody else did, basically. Uh, the algorithm, you know, th this is very important that uh, that we mention about Ethiopia. You were saying it, it quite some characteristic of the place. I must add that the local algorithm of considering things is unknown. It's not that you say, okay, maybe if I only report on their side and their favorite thing, no, it's not working that way. But what do you mean? You're, you're saying, you're saying, uh, you're saying that maybe, maybe reporting could have worked if you were only reporting the side of uh, I don't know, EDFs. I, I, remember, I remember this situation. Sometimes you say, okay, you will get the call. Listen, why you're saying that there is only minority children there in Tigray. We oh, always the same amount. And you say, no problem. Take me there. Give me the permit. I'm, I'm coming. We pay everything, but please give us access. No. Other times you say, okay. I'm already on the field. I'm on their side of the front line. And we want to report on the problems you're having. Da, da, da. You start reporting 12 hours after someone says, no, you must go. We must leave. End of the story. So th this is the, the, the kind of things I'm telling you that it's, 
what is guiding, uh, what is setting the line on what can be done and what cannot be done. It's uh, for me still after four years working there, it's completely unknown. But as I was telling you, in our case, we, we managed to have access. We managed to keep on reporting uh, what other people were not. Uh, yeah, that's it. But at the same time, I remember, as, as you can imagine, being the only ones reporting, you also get a lot of, of contacts or requests from other colleagues saying, listen, I want to go, how we do it? And you say, there is nothing to do. You know, just apply and let's see. And sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't. A mystery, honestly. Um, can you tell me as a photojournalist how you learned during that time, how you learned about the conflict? I mean, were you being advised by, um, you know, the team members that you had already? Were you doing your own independent research? I ask this because it's it's very complicated unless you've been some like, uh, Ethiopian historian or something to truly understand all the caveats and all the complexities that this conflict um, was uh, was characterized around. Right there, there's a lot of things to know. How did you how did you get through all that? Because it was hard for me, and I've spoken to a ton of people, and it's very difficult to summarize even today, um, and especially some of the splinter conflicts that are still now emerging after this war has quote unquote ended. Um, yeah. Tell me about that if you could. I think it's, it's a very good question. First, you know, we were, we were living in Ethiopia, no? Yeah. Already since two years before. Sure. So we were quite familiar, but it's interesting because well, it's interesting what happens when you have the chance to be embedded in this society and you're mm -hmm. just not parachuting to tell a story. Sure. But I remember having this conversation many times that in one moment of the conflict, I live, you know, I lived in, in Addis, I had Ethiopian friends and I would sense a, a dimension that I, we could not grasp. And it, it's a dimension that had to do with the, with the feeling of uh, of revenge, and I'm sorry, I'm not saying it in a pejorative way. Sure, I'm saying in the sense of people that lived under a political regime that I was not living under because I, I already started with uh, with Abby to live right. there. Right. And for many of that people, it meant a lot what was going on. Uh, so yeah, you, you ask a lot. No, I, I, I. I what you're saying is funny. You know, one of the the persons I was consulting the most is a is an a, a French Ethiopologist, no, so someone specialized in the history of Ethiopia, and and he was helping me through him and through other contacts he gave me to to understand better what's the situation. But you know, I I can tell you this as an Argentinian, no, um, there is no no thing as similar as a World Cup, as a war. The, this, this mindset of black or white, us or them, right. it's, it's very important for the war to flourish and, and to be able to, to be accepted uh, with all what it means in terms of of people killed, of children killed, of rape as a weapon, of people malnourished because of the consequences of the war. This is very, very important. It has to be that same ambient of a World Cup where there is no chance that, you know, you will be in Argentina and you will say you're French in the middle of that last game. And th this is the thing, though. For me, I, I leave it that way, this totalitarian effect, either you are with us or against us, uh, it's, it's quite strong. Yeah, that was certainly a theory that went around when I was studying international relations in Europe. They, they The Europeans constantly told me that the reason they are so in love with football is that because they've simply replaced it with war. Um, and that's, that's what's happening um, 
or they've replaced war with football, excuse me. And that's what's, that's what's, uh, that's what's happening on some sort of ephemeral philosophical level. Um, as an American, I wasn't sure how much I believed that, but there is something there. There is something about, uh, the parallels between, um, taking sides and not seeing the nuances. And I think that it was very difficult for me. It still is to, to truly understand, um, the dynamics of the, of the Tigray war. Um, and that's why I want to talk to people like you all the time. I, I'm constantly, um, and I, I've, I've traveled to Addis, I've traveled through Ethiopia, spent a lot of time in the South, and the country is a fascinating one for me. Uh, but just understanding this sort of political dynamic is, 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 um, is I think, uh, something I go out of my way to try to understand. Yeah, it's, um, well, it's still a mystery, you know. It, it is a bit. Um, uh, yeah. I think. Tell me about, uh, tell me some more about, uh, about getting into take, uh, the, the, the front lines. I mean, did you experience any sort of extreme danger? Was there any time you felt threatened? Um, I know that you were being curated probably by, um, the EDF side and the government officials telling you where you can and cannot go and how, how you were getting permits. Is that not the case? What, what was, what was, what was, no, no, no. What was these wars? Different to any other experience yeah. that had there. Wow! Oh no, it's a whole mystery. No, I don't think I was in danger. Uh, I, I, I don't think so. Uh -huh. uh, not uh, because we had very scarce access. Yeah. So more than conflict reporting, I, I was doing post conflict. Right. Yeah. Maybe a few hours after, no. But at the end, we were not able to, to go to the front line because they didn't want us there, no one sure. wanted us. So I can tell you that for me, Ben, that there was this dangerous thing. The only danger is that the, there were things you could not do. I, fo I photographed 10% of the things I saw, honestly, because there were these situations that you could not pick up the camera. I remember the first days, you know, I felt danger because I had no clue of what was going on. Right. And we were just going to the front in a, in a, in a pickup uh, truck and just trying to get as north as possible. Everything was very confusing. You saw people coming, you saw funerals, you saw militia people injured, dead, and you could not do that like this. You could not because they didn't want you there. So that, you can say it was a bit dangerous, no? I'm, it doesn't matter how many permits you had, how many letters, some, some will say no, end of the story. And then what would have happened? What would have happened had you picked up your camera in those moments? I mean, no, man. I, I mean, obviously something happened, so I'm kind of curious. Yeah, people will lose their minds, I, I remember I remember that, that once the, the time we were, let's say, consciously more in the front line. Okay. Sure. The the Tigrians were at, were getting towards Samara region. We we managed to get to the Ramara front line to the last village where there were all the militia and all the militaries there. Of course, with a lot of agreement, with a lot of letters, with a lot of everything. And I remember arriving there and suddenly we will say, what the fuck? End of the story. No pick up the camera, people will get violent. And of course you try to do as much as you can. No, I, I you know, one of the advantages of cameras today is that, you know, you have this, I think this is something fantastic in professional cameras that I don't know why they didn't do it before. This flip, uh, um screens mm -hmm. so you know have your camera on your wrist level and you can keep on shooting you try to get things like that no but sure so th this was the this was the thing so it was very frustrating in, in that level you, you could not understand why and um, all but yeah sorry you can no it, it, uh, just remember that the official speech is that everything is because of BBC, CNN, and, and Reuters. No, this is what they were saying. This is the war. This is the problem. They are the problem. Yeah. The normal campaign. 
uh, and everything on the westerns. Um, look, uh, for, for me, what the, that was a very frustrating period. And what I'm saying about the no more campaign was even more. You know, there was a point we couldn't leave our homes in in, in Addis. Um, but you know, the, if I ever felt a danger, maybe it was in that situation, in those situations where you don't know how to move, how to push it, not to push it. But yeah. Why were you... Oh, sorry, to, to make it brief, yeah. more than, than feel myself in danger, I felt frustrated. Sure. It must have been frustrating. I mean, the, um, the just the, the, the amount of censorship that happened through this was, was, um, was very frustrating for, I think, a lot of people, just to get a better understanding around what was happening. What was the danger you experienced in Addis? You said there, were, there was a time you couldn't leave your, your home. Oh, just the evening. when the Tigrayans were coming towards the capital. Yeah, it was what October, November. That's about a, a year after, right? Or almost a yeah, year. And twenty twenty one. So, for people who don't know, the what was the perceived underdog? So, the Tigray uh, defense forces um, had almost surrounded the capital, and they kind of overstepped. Right? That's everyone thought. They weren't going to be, they have all these military victories. They had this unheard of military victory against the uh, governmental forces. And then they started, they were, like, as you said, surrounding the capital and nobody knew if they were actually going to take the capital. Like it almost seemed. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, we're getting very close. 120 kilometers. Yeah. Place. That's ridiculous. Yeah. We were big chances. The game changer were the drones. Right, yeah, the Turkish drones. That were drones. There were drones at the beginning of the conflict. Sure, helped to to make everything possible. But then in June, seven months, eight months after the conflict started, there were no more drones. The Tigrayans took over all what they lost in terms of territory, mainly their capital, and they were able to advance towards the capital of of Ethiopia, towards Addis. Everybody started freaking out. Many, most of the expats were evacuated. Yeah, but you know, we stayed. Uh, we were waiting to to see the development and things. But there was a very strong campaign. Uh, first, ethnic campaign against Tigrayans living in Addis. Um, th that we must say it was the most difficult thing for people. Uh, you know, people were locked in, in I'm, and I'm talking about not young people, I'm talking also about elders that had some kind of Tigrayan blood. Sure. And, and I'm talking, the terms is ethnic, right? And um, so the, the, that was very difficult, but also again, it's, there was a big animosity against uh, foreigners. I, I heard stories of people being Pitted in restaurants because they were farmers. Fantastic. No, it was a, so there was a big strong campaign against international media. So you will go in the street and you will get into problems, basically. Yeah. Well, uh, I couldn't only imagine what that was like. Hopefully, uh, nothing happened. Uh, were, I mean, were you okay during that time? Yeah, but I, I'm just the well, thread was there. Yeah, no, I, I had problem. I, I had colleagues that had problems. Of really? Course, no? yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I, local colleagues, for example, working for 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 some of the targeted media that had to be saved by the police because they were going to be lynched. Wow. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, what's the thing? Yeah, what a startling situation. Um, now that this war, and I certainly it's not over. It's just kind of. Uh, what's the word manifested itself in other ways or other conflicts now that are happening, um, elsewhere in Ethiopia, what are you shooting now? I mean, are you covering the, the larger geopolitical or post Tigray war aftermath? What's, what's happening? Uh, what's it like there now? Yes. I don't know because I guess in, in case I, I'm, I'm between Nairobi and, and Addis. I, I'm in Nairobi basically because I'm trying to work in some other things because nowadays in, in, in Addis, 
it's not possible to to do much sure. uh, to any place out of the city you need to request a permit and usually you don't get it so it's really complicated really complicated there, there are not many many chances I'm a freelancer um so you know I need to um, I need to keep on working um so I, I'm covering other things no I'm I recently came back from from Mogadishu. Uh, I've been doing stories in Kenya. I, I was in Uganda. Um, I'm I'm working around. What's happening in Somalia? What are you covering there? I went to the story. Actually, it was quite a positive one about changes in 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 the political and economical situation in Mogadishu or in in, in Somalia. And there is a lot of investment. There is a lot of. I, I was doing a story for the Financial Times, uh, and it's interesting. You know, all this uh, interest in in investment by diaspora, but also by local people. A lot of construction. For me, as an Argentinian coming from a country that we are quite pessimistic about, it, it, it was amazing to to find that level of optimism in such a complicated context. Do you mean uh, you're, you're being Argentina as in you're skeptical of international aid or, or the development? I mean, uh, that must be what you're referring Bro, to. That, that's the, that's out of, that's empirical experience. Oh, I'm a skeptical about, about my own country, you know? Uh, oh, I see. We Argentinians, we love to complain about the situation in Argentina and we are quite pessimistic. Which is, you did say at the top of the conversation, you did say that you were losing your idealism. Tell me about that. What's making you lose your idealism? No, I was telling you that, uh, of course, at the beginning of the, of, the, well, of, of my career as a photographer, you expect a lot of the photography. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, then with the years, this was to compensate a, a bit of two idealistic things I was saying, you know, that uh, about that I would like that photography will help people to change things. And I truly believe that. Um, at, at the same time, you know, I'm telling you, I, I don't think that photography per se can, can change the world. It's, sure. it's us that can change it, no? Tell me what you think about, um, do you find there are other conflicts happening around the world that are parallel to this in terms of getting access, like, for example, I don't see a lot of coverage. It's very difficult to get coverage in Myanmar. Um, and what's happening there? Do you know anything about that? Uh, no, I don't know about that. Uh, and I'm trying to... Um, I'm trying to think about other experiences I had in this level, and I don't know, honestly. Yeah, it's... You see that... It, yeah, I've seen in Ukraine people can cover... Uh, and I remember when I, when I was in in in, in the Middle East, uh, we could work. Uh, here, it's uh, it's a bit too much, you know, on this this level of blocking the the media, no, blockade of, of the media. Um, I don't know. All, all I can tell you is that for me, when I'm working out of Ethiopia. It's amazing how easy things can be. <laughs> you know, at the time, I cannot believe it. How easy it's to work in other places. Yeah, no, certainly. Um, what a fascinating uh, fascinating time you must have had. And I mean, it was, it obviously, it was very challenging. Um, and I know we are approaching time, so I want to give you a chance to talk about anything else. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience? Is there anything that we haven't touched on? Um, if, uh, yeah, I've, I've just, uh, I'm always curious. Uh, I kind of ask everybody this sort of open-ended question at the end. Um, um, it's, well, for me, I, I, uh, I might have lost uh, a lot of idealism about the world and about our profession, no? but, uh, I really want to believe that th this war is over. Th th this is my feeling. Even though I have no access, even though we cannot travel, uh, the situation is quite unknown for all of us. 
Uh, I just hope that this is this is over. That, uh, this is the only thing I I, I really hope. Uh, you know, there are a lot of political implications, Eritrea, the Amaras, uh, but but it, for me, the, the biggest fear during all this uh, during all this conflict was that I felt that uh, very easily they were able to unleash the beast. Yeah. And to take it back is quite complicated. And we see it today by all the all the other conflicts that are happening in Ethiopia. So that you know, it's that. I I, I want to I, I want to believe in, in in the in the possibilities of everything stopping easily, you know, um, fast because considering all the difficulties that the Ethiopian people have, uh, that's the only way. Yeah. It's it's a desire to to believe in in things that are difficult to happen. That way. That way. Yeah, I I agree. No, I I certainly hope it's over as well. I mean, it's been catastrophic for for everybody, um, and uh, um, it certainly feels like it's coming to a close. But as we know, conflicts often spur into other um, other manifestations, right? So. You know, we can't predict the future, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I appreciate your work. I appreciate your time this morning um, or this evening where you are. Uh, thanks again. I appreciate it. Can, um, can you share where people can follow you? Are you on Twitter or your website? Where where, where can people follow you? I, uh, talking about difficulties, I have very recently restarted my, my Instagram. Oh, okay, cool. My Instagram live and, and my Twitter live. So recently, I've been posting things there. Uh, what's that? Uh, what's that? Um, what's your uh, handle there uh, on Instagram? My, my Instagram is Edusonico. Okay, yeah, I'll put it for anyone listening in audio. I'll put it in the description, and uh, also anyone listening or watching on YouTube, that will be in the description as well. So you have uh, Instagram, Twitter. You have a website, no? Yes, I also have a website, which is my name, eduardosoteras.com. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll include that as well. Eduardo, thanks so much today. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Have a, have a good one. Thank you.